Hello, my name is Keshwani. That's K E S H W A N I. Keshwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the T's. We have been solving math problems out of this book here, the study manual for the T's. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. The problems that we are about to solve are the ones that you will find on page number 308. Eight. Please turn to it. Page number 308 and today is our lesson number 77. Let's take a look at the very first problem on the page. Problem number 19. Problem number 19 is asking us which is which is approximately equal to 8.2 and the answer choices that are given to us are square root of 10 square root of 17, square root of 67, and square root of 79. Let's take a look at them one by one. But for learn that is for the for, for that is for the learning purposes. We're going to look at that one by one purely for the learning purposes. But as far as, far as the exam is concerned, all you have to understand, all you have to realize here is that all you have to realize here is that the square root of 64 is 8. That we do know. Therefore, the square root of 67 is the one that comes closest to it, 8.2. Therefore, the square root of 67, among, among the four answer choices that are given to us, the square root of 67 is going to be, this is how we write it, the square root of 67 is going to be a little bit more than 8. A little bit more than 8. That's all. Answer is, is root of 67. Now we're going to look at all the others, as I said, just for learning purposes. Let's start with square root of square root of 10. This is how we write, the square root of 9 is here, which is 3, and the square root of 16 is here, which is equal to 4. Square root of 10 comes very close to the square root of 9. It falls towards the left end of the spectrum. Therefore, this is how we write the square root of 10. We're going to write that as just a little more than little more than 3. This is how we write it. The square root of 10, we cannot say square root of 10 is equal to 3. This would be wrong. It is not equal to 3. If we're going to leave it in this form, then we have to change this this sign to approximately equal to. That would be okay. This is correct. This this is correct because here what we are claiming is that we are not claiming that the square root of three, the square root of ten is equal to three. What we are claiming is that the square root of ten is approximately equal to three, which is true. Or if you want the equal sign, we can write it as like this: the square root of ten is equal to something more than three. Something more than three. We write that with a small plus sign on the top, not not next to it, but on top of it, just a small tiny plus sign. That tells us something more than 3. The square root of 10 is something more than 3. Little more than 3. Similarly, if we were looking at the square root of say 14, the square root of 14 is towards this end of the spectrum. So this is how we write it. Square root of, four, the square root of 14 is equal to something a little less than 4. Or something a little less than 4. Similarly, the square root of 17 is right there. The square root of 17 is going to fall right here. The square root of 17 falls right here. And therefore, the square root of 17 is going to be just a little over 4. 4 plus, just a little over 4. What about 67 and 79? Let's take a look at them. 67 and 79. So, here we're looking at square root of 64, which is 8, and square root of 81, which is 9. And therefore, the square root of 67 is going to be just, just over, the square root of 67 is going to be just over 8, 8 plus, which we just found out was 8.2 approximately. And similarly, square root of 79, if you have to express the idea of square root of 79, how do we write it? The square root of 79, 79 falls towards this end of the spectrum. The scale goes, the scale goes from 64 to 89. 79 goes towards this end of the spectrum. 79 is going to fall somewhere here. The square root of 79 is equal to little less than 9. We, don't, we do not write that as something more than 8. Something more than 8, we are towards this half of the spectrum. It's not just a little more than 8. It's actually a lot more than 8. It is closer to 9. Something less than 9. That's all. Let's go to the next one, shall we? Let's move on to the next one. Just give me one second. Next one. Number 20. Number 20, they are asking us to add up two mixed fractions. 
3 and 3 quarter plus 2 and 5 6 and the answer choices again are A, B, C and D we have 2 and 1 fifth we have 4 and 3 quarter we have 5 and a half and finally we have 6 and 7 twelfth Again, as I always remind you, the reason I have uh, the reason we have written down the answers on the blackboard, each one of them, is because as I always remind you that the exam that you're preparing for, T's, is a standardized exam. And just like any other standardized exam anywhere on the planet for anything at all, it shares certain characteristics. And one of the most important features of a standardized exam is that the amount of work that you put, I'm, I'm, I know I'm breaking into sermon like, like always, the amount of work that you put in in a given problem on a standardized exam, not the regular exam that you take in a school, I'm talking about a standardized exam, the amount of work that one puts into it is determined by two factors. The amount of work that you put into a given problem depends equally on what is being asked and what is being told, what, what is it that you're being told and what is it that the question is asking, and, and it equally depends on how the answer choices are presented in front of you, how the answer choices are laid out. The, the, the format of the answer choices, the, what's the word I'm looking for? The nature of the answer choices also equally determines how much effort I want to put into it. Do you understand that? So I'm going to show you the quick and dirty way here to recognize the right, to, uh, to recognize the right answer here. If you were taking the real exam, if we were taking the real exam, we wouldn't waste any time here. We'll just find a quick and dirty way like that. And then I'm going to actually do it out the classical way, the traditional way, just for learning purposes. Do you understand? What we, have, what we have to understand is this. Look, just listen to me. Listen. This is 3 and this is 2. 3 plus 2 is already 5. Plus the 3 quarter. This guy plus this guy plus 3 quarter is already 5 and 3 quarter. How can, how the bloody hell can it be 5 and a half? I don't know what the answer is, but the answer is obviously more than 3 and 5 and 3 quarter because 3 plus 2 is 5. 5 and 3 quarter is already more than 5 and a half. The answer is D. The answer is D. Another way to look at it, again, I'm going to show you a different perspective. Just It's a matter of perspective. So Sometimes one thing clicks in somebody's mind and sometimes some other, something else clicks in, in, in someone else's mind. Or even in the same person. If you present to me a question today, I might look at it in one way and then tomorrow the exact same question a week later, maybe something else will click in my mind. It depends on how we look at it, whatever clicks. Another way, another way to look at the whole thing is this, okay, watch, watch, what, I, watch what I have to say. Another way to look at the whole thing is that, I say to myself, 5, 2, 2 and 5, 6. 2 and 5, 6 is very close to 3. 2 and 5, 6 is very close to 3. 3 plus a 3, you see right here, 3 plus a 3. I don't know what the answer is, but whatever the hell it is, it's got to be around 6. Something more than six because not only this is already not only this is already six, but I still got three quarter and a five six to go. Of course, the answer is D. Answer is not going to be five because three plus three is already six. Let's do the classic. Let's do the problem classical way in, in a classical way, shall we? I have to rewrite everything. Three and three quarter and two and five five six. Three and three quarter plus two and five six. So let's rewrite it. So we have to we have to show we have to add these things up here. We need to add them up. What we're going to do here, we're going to keep our work simple. Okay, don't carry don't carry the luggage of the three and the two together on your back throughout the entire journey. That's too much of a burden. Just leave that alone. Let's keep the three and the four, or rather, let's keep the two and three and the two. Let's keep three and the two, the, the whole number, the integers in abeyance. We're just going to consider right now on 3 quarter plus 5 six. Okay, watch what happens. If, if we had to add up these three fractions, 3 quarter and 5 six, 3 quarter and 5 six, how do we add them up? Well, we need the common denominator, don't we? The denominator has to be the same. How can you make the common denominator? Can you think of a number that we can divide evenly by 4 and 6? That number will be 12, obviously. So how do we make the denominator of this guy 12? Well, it's very simple. Take this 3 quarter and multiply the top and bottom by 3. Now 3 times 4 is 12. How do we make the denominators into uh, 12 here? It's 5, 6. How do we convert 6 into 12? Well, multiply the top and bottom by 2. Which is perfectly okay to do because we're not changing anything. It is still 5, 6. It is still 5, 6. We're just multiplying it by 
2 over 2, which is 1. You can multiply any quantity by 1, it doesn't change the quantity. Similarly here, 3 quarter is still 3 quarter because all we have done is multiply it by 1. Except 1 takes the form of 3 over 3. Now we have 3 times 4 which is 12, we have 6 times 2 which is 12. They both have the same denominator, we just add up the top. So the denominator is 12, on the top we get 3 times 3 which is 9, and we get 5 times 2 which is 10. So we get 19 over 12, which can be written as 12 over 12 plus 7 over 12. Are you with me so far? 12 over 12 of course is 1. So it's 1 and 7 12. The answer is 1 and 7 12 so far. Don't forget plus we have a 3 and a 2. So the final answer is 3 plus 2 plus 1 and 7 12. 3 plus 2 plus 1 is 6 and 7 12. And 7 12. There you go, which is, which is what we found for the answer choice to D. But if you were to sit there and do all this work out in the exam, that will be a sheer waste of time, it will be silly. That would not be a smart way of solving the problem when the correct answer is just staring in your face. It's got to be more than 6, obviously, what the hell, it's got 3 and uh, 2 and 5, 6, which is almost 3. 3 plus 3 is 6 already, uh, is 6 already. plus you got all the coins. Look at them as coins. 3 quarters, it's like a 75 cents, it's almost a dollar. 5, 6 is another, another almost a dollar. You understand it's going to be more than six. The last thing I want to do before I close the video today is to actually uh, look at this word, word abeyance. It came up in the conversation in the lecture. We said that we're going to keep the whole numbers, the integers. Always keep your integers, uh, as, uh, put them aside, keep them in abeyance and just add them up at the end. There is no need to carry all that luggage on your back as I said throughout the entire journey. Abeyance. When did we learn this word? I'm looking at my vocabulary list as you know and under A if I can find it. Which day did we learn this word in our vocabulary lesson? Abeyance. Just give me one second, okay? When you try to find it faster, it takes longer. Day number nine. If you're interested in learning this word, along with some other interesting uh, vocabulary words to, to improve your vocabulary, just type in vocabulary, day nine, along with my name, Keshwani. It'll pop right up. And the word is abeyance, which means to put something aside, to put something uh, in a state of inactivity. As, it, as in, we'll deal with it later. I'll talk to you tomorrow, okay? Bye now.